When I started the film, I had no idea how we were going to do the demon voice. <laughs> and Billy pulled out a book of Hieronymus Bosch paintings and said, I want Linda Blair's voice to sound like Hieronymus Bosch. Didn't necessarily make total sense to me, but the impression was that Linda Blair's voice should, should be a kind of chorus of voices. And at the center of it should be whatever we in general consider to be evil. Who are you? No one there! We took Linda Blair's voice in the pre-production and we spent 150 hours making Linda Blair's voice into a different voice. Your mother's in here with us, Karis. We made her sound bad, evil. And I'm the devil! We played the stuff for Friedkin and he turned around and he said, that's no good. You know, I thought, oh, fuck, 150 hours of work just out the window. Billy just thought another voice would be better than trying to treat Reagan's into some electronic system, which we didn't really have technically at that time. I started to verbalize to, to Bill and others that the demon should not in any way be the, a man's voice, but it should be a kind of neutral voice, neither male nor female but with male characteristics, but with female characteristics. Who the hell sounds like that? Who has ever sounded like that? And the name Mercedes McCambridge came into my mind's eye. She was a great actress and had this most distinguished voice. We gave her raw eggs and whiskey and she started chain smoking and I lashed her to a chair. Now kindly undo these straps. The most curious things would happen in her throat. Double and triple sounds would emerge at once. Wheezing sounds, very much akin to what you could imagine a person inhabited by various demons would sound like. <laughs> Basically, she performed it under great duress and I was, like, stunned at what she put herself and allowed me to put her through in order to accomplish this. They were all uh, human voices in most cases. Sometimes we put some animal voices in. He likes to mix voices up occasionally, different sounds to create a sound. No one there! It's a language, all right. It was a trial and error, put a bunch of them together, listen to them until finally you, you arrive at the one that he likes. I felt that the sound could, could have a dynamic that went, that swung between loud, very loud, oppressive noises and total dead silence. I don't think there was anything like it sound-wise, up to that point where everything was just super exaggerated. It took 16 weeks to make this track, and we did a lot of experimentation with various noises. You just play it against the picture and see what happens, you know, and, and create what, I, what we call the mohawk, which is the mohawk is like when, it, you know, two dogs see one another and all of a sudden the hair goes up on the back of their neck, the, you know, bad vibes. And well, there's certain music that does that. There's certain sounds that do that. You know, we were trying everything. You know, I got fake fingernails and would scratch stuff, you know, or I'd, we'd get rats and bring them in and have them run around a box. I mean, we... This is the Ron Nagel Hamsters in the Cage. Track two. Took a bee and did, you know, what every kid does with insects, puts it in a jar and punches holes in the top, and the bee started buzzing around, and I just stuck the mic there. Sometimes they would be processed. So I thought, well, where could you really get, you know, a massive sound of 
horror, you know, on, a, on an audible level. And uh, so I said, well, the slaughterhouse, you know. I saw a film called El Topo. And I said to my production manager, who did that sound? He said, there's a guy named Gonzalo Gavira. He spoke not a word of English, but we brought him in here and showed him the film, and he was flabber. He didn't understand any of the words, but he got what was going on. He actually stood in front of a mic with the film on the screen behind him like that. We opened a mic, and he would use his body and objects and things, cans and various things, and he created a lot of the sounds that you hear in the film. He borrowed an old leather wallet, a cracked old leather wallet that had, as this does, credit cards in it from someone on the sound crew. And he held this cracked leather wallet up to a microphone like this. That became the sound of the little girl's head turning around. That and a number of other sounds were created in front of an open mic by a Mexican peasant who had no shoes. The power of Christ compels you! The original composer was Lalo Schifrin, and uh, Billy Friedkin had brought Lalo in to screen the film. And there was a lot of pretentious uh, uh, ooga-booga about, you know, the kind of... Uh, presence or feeling or vibe that the music was supposed to have. Lalo said, uh, trust me, it'll be, it'll be wonderful. So he went away and he wrote the score of The Exorcist. When the time came, it was like, you know, I don't know how many people were out there, like, you know, a hundred of LA's finest musicians strike up the band. And anyhow, Lalo's sitting there with his chest out and they play this score, it's, it's a beautiful score, but it was all over. It was kind of a silence. And it was like, get this fucking brand X Stravinsky out of here. I mean, he went ape shit. Billy did. So they stopped the recording right in the middle. I mean, you have 110 guys standing there, you know, and you just say, go home. You know, and fired him right there on the spot with his wife and his agent and everybody. I mean, it was like, look, that's it. And Billy says, give me that music. So we took the music off the recorder, handed it to him, he ran out in the front of the Tadeo and threw it across the street into the parking lot. He said, that's where that music belongs. Billy said to me, uh, did you ever hear of a, a record called Tubular Bells? I said, yeah, Mike Oldfield. He says, go up and get that. After cutting the opening sequence of Iraq, we kind of went through the whole film and repaced it. Looking at it, I thought, well, there's a lot of exposition, basically, that you really don't need because it's slowing the film down, like uh, taking a walk with Reagan through Washington, seeing all the monuments. 